Hello and welcome to another Hip Historian Virtual Happy Hour Tour. I am Brenda with AARP. We are the nation's largest nonprofit, nonpartisan organization dedicated to empowering people 50 and older to choose how they live as they age. With a nationwide presence, AARP strengthens communities and advocates for what matters most to more than 100 million Americans 50 plus and their families health security, financial stability, and personal fulfillment. AARP also produces the nation's largest circulation publications, the AARP Magazine and AARP Bulletin. To learn more, please visit aarp.org backslash about dash AARP. In the month of June, AARP offers events and enriching experiences close to home and from your home that help you make connections and serve others. While our situations are different, our need for connection is universal. Now more than ever, we know that connecting with family and friends is vital to aging well and living longer and happier lives. Visit us at aarp.org backslash local for more information. Thank you again. And with that, I'll turn it over to Marshall. Well, hello and good evening. I want to welcome you all here to Arizona History Happy Hour. I am so happy that you can join us this evening. Oh, you know, it's a lovely balmy day here in Arizona. Well, not so balmy, but indeed. So happy you can join us. So my name is Marshall Shore, and I am the host of Arizona City Happy Hour. And so, you know, happy you can all join us on a variety of platforms, as well as if you like this episode or want to hear more, you can always take a look on YouTube under Hip Historian for the archives as well. And we are starting to put them also up on Spotify and I think me, maybe even iTunes slowly. Uh, migrating there as well as podcast. So today is June 22nd. And so back on this date in 1892, by order of President Benjamin Harris, the one of a kind Casa Grande, that great mud house, which is in Coolidge, not in Casa Grande, but it became the first prehistoric and cultural site to be established as a national monument here in the U.S. So go celebrate it. If you haven't been, we're actually going to talk a little bit more about it at the um, towards the end of the show. It is also International Kissing Day. Now you know, kisses are said to relieve stress, burn calories, and benefit your immunity. So I don't know how many kisses it takes to lose much weight, but you know, it is also National Eclair Day. So, you know, whether you make them out of chocolate, cover them in chocolate, cover them in fruit, doing all kinds of things, you know, <laughs> maybe consume them and try to lose some weight because of kissing day. Um, but make sure you get the authorization or the okay from the other person or the other critter that you will be kissing. It is also National Limoncello Day. So on this day, we like to remember that, you know, when life gives you lemons, make limoncello. Make it into something that you can, of course, have more calories and reduce those inhibitions, but we won't go down that path. Um, it is also Dragon Boat Festival Day. Now, you know, I don't know if they did anything. I didn't see anything about Tempe Town Lake having dragon boats on it today, but you can often go out there and see the dragon boats out there. Now, these date from 2,000 years ago when actually there was a beloved poet and they were searching for him with those boats. And it is also celebrate 
HVAC people because you know without their abilities that technology we would not be quite so happy here in Arizona right now um, I just had a friend who was out of with AC for about a week and a half and just got it replaced so I'm sure he's very happy with his HVAC tech so all right so let's move on so what can you expect from tonight's show well you know we always have a little bit of Little Arizona. We talk about some Arizona music as well as we have a beverage. We do some trivia as well as have a special guest. So if this is your first time watching, you might wonder who is that man and why is he on my screen? Well, as I said, my name is Marshall Shore. And so I got here about 23 years ago. I was in Brooklyn working at a Carnegie building and decided it was time to trade that snow, that slush, that bitter cold wind for some sunshine. And so got here and started working in a little library in South Phoenix where there was a rich oral tradition of the community. And, you know, I started learning about Arizona through its stories of the communities. And that's what I'm still doing today. So as soon as I got here, we promptly moved into a beautiful 1956 ranch that was originally oh so many tones of beige. I am happy to say now it is just two, seafoam and cantaloupe. And there's what my kitchen looks like today. Lots of buttercream yellow towel with working appliances that match. And so my house is kind of a time capsule. But as soon as we got here, all I kept hearing about how there was no history here. But, you know, I knew that wasn't true because every time I would go somewhere, whether it was on a bike, on foot, on a scooter, on a bus, on a train, it didn't matter where I was going. I kept running across so many amazing people, places, and stories. Now, I'm also called the hip historian. And so if you find a copy of So Scottsdale, this current month is their man issue. And they chose to showcase my, <laughs> my personal style sense, which is more is better. And so, um, so that was a fun little bit. As well as we are getting ready to, at the end of September, we are going to be doing our band book reading. And this is at least the fifth, if not sixth one we've been doing every year and if you like to watch horizon on pbs we did a series of interviews for june being pride month and so we are talking about lgbtq history during horizon as well as during other shows as well um, i will be at mesa public library on saturday afternoon at two o'clock downtown talking about lgbtq history right here in arizona i see Pam has found and Anders has found the chat. You know, if you feel, go right ahead and jump in there and ask questions if you'd like, interact with us. You can also reach out to me on Facebook, Instagram, email, or even via my website because I love to hear from you all. And so, you know, with Arizona Tree Happy Hour, it's like we do things like Little Arizona because, you know, I talk about being from... New York, but I really grew up in a small Midwest town of about 25. Thank you, Doreen. Happy to be home. And you'll notice this is actually no green screen. I'm actually in the process of kind of <laughs> rearranging the house. So this is actually my, what my living room looks like at this moment. A bit of a disaster. And so I always want to give a shout out to PJ because he keeps me well lubricated. And so tonight, we are having a desert blossom, which is a little bit, which is some kettle one peach and orange blossom vodka, as well as some chelly limoncello, which is produced locally right here, as well as some Aperol, Cointreau, some sugarcane, and some Arizona lemon juice as well, as we celebrate that turning lemons into something Oh, so tasty. And so 
for Little Arizona, we are going to talk about Sun City. Since we're kind of doing a little kind of a throwback to the 60s, I thought, you know, let's talk about that town that, you know, when Del Webb was building, they didn't know quite what would happen when they opened up on New Year's Day. January 1st of 1960, whether they were going to be a flop, whether it was going to be a huge success, they had no clue, but it quickly turned into a mob scene. People wanting to check out the houses, wanting to buy, wanting to move into Sun City, and that has not changed. There are now many Sun Cities, not just near Sun City, but across the entire country that all stem from here. It's an active retirement community, and they have the very first model home that was built by Del Webb is now the Sun City Museum, which is well worth checking out. You can go see things like the Sun Dome, which is just down the street, and they also have concert series there, so it's a fun place to check out and just see what they've got going on. And as we approach July 4th, there is... The Sundial Recreation Center, they also have the Bell Recreation Center, and it has a copy of the Liberty Bell. And so every July 4th, they like to do a presentation as well as you can go off and ring the Liberty Bell. That it was said to be donated, that was made of things that the community gave for them to melt down. That's how they created the Liberty Bell. All right. So now is a chance where we actually get to hear from someone else other than just me. So let me bring on my friend, Chris. Hello there. Hello, Marshall. Thanks for having me on. Hello, everyone. I am so happy you're joining us tonight. Oh, my gosh. We're going to have so much fun. Oh, yes. So, Chris, for folks who don't know who you are, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, I was born here, and uh, we moved around a little bit while my dad was in the military, but Phoenix has always been my home. Um, uh, but what really my earliest childhood memories are, of course, of the Wallace and Ladmo show. And for the last 26 years, I've been the president and founder of the official Wallace and Ladmo fan club. Uh, we moved to Facebook about 14 years ago, and it went from just about 1,000 people to 40,000 people in the fan club. Yes, and I post daily. I have been doing the fan club now for 26 years and preserving the media from not only the Wallace and Ladmo show, but from Legend City, Mike Candelo, Aquanetta. And Don Bowles. Um, so I know a little bit about everything for the last 61 years. Nice. And so I know we've got some trivia coming up to highlight some of those. Not all of those. Um, and so, you know, people like to, some folks like to keep track of the trivia in the chat session. Some folks do it on their arm with a marker. Hopefully it's water washable and not permanent. As well as then my friend Anita has a very special notebook that she keeps everything in so she can go back and see her scores. So without any further ado, let's jump into some trivia. And just to let you know, it's all multiple choice. So if you don't know the answer, all you've got to do is just pick one. You might be right. You might be wrong. But then the fun part is, is we're going to come back after a little bit of Arizona music break. And then we're going to talk about the stories of those answers. So you then next time you go to a cocktail party, you have a little bit more fodder to throw out with your beverages. All right. So our first question. So in 1968, what famous presidential candidate visited Christown Mall? Was that A, Barry Goldwater? B, Robert Kennedy, C, Richard Nixon, or D, Ronald Reagan? Well, I, I think somebody hit behind you wants to join in the conversation. Oh, uh, yeah, that's June, everyone. Well, hello, June. Kennedy, one of them. 
She nice. wants attention. <laughs> All right. So who do you think back in 1968 visited Chris Town of those folks? All right. Question two. What music venue was next to Legend City and was once owned by Stevie Nicks's father? Was it A, the press room, B, Nita's hideaway, C, Compton Terrace, or D, the clubhouse? So which one of those was a music venue right next to Legend City? All right. Question three. What Miss America used to perform at Legend City? Was it A, Betty Lou Lindy, B, Lynn Freeze, C, Vonda K. Van Dyke, or D, Donna McElroy? So which one of those was a Miss America that used to perform at Legend City? All right. Moving on to question four. Who first owned Legend City? <coughs> was it A, Walt Disney, B, Del Webb, C, Louis Crandall, or G, Jerry Colangelo. So which one of those folks do you think first owned a Legend City? Question five. What famous brothers got their start on the Lou King Ranger show? Was it A, the Everly Brothers? B, Jerry and Wayne Newton? C, the Beach Boys? Or D, David and Ricky Nelson? So which brothers got their start on the Lou King Ranger show? All right. Question six. What character on the Walls and Ladmo show was related to Barry Goldwater? Was it A, Aunt Maud? B, Gerald? Oh, I never knew Gerald had a last name. Springer. C, Harvey Trundle. Or D, Craig Dingle. So which one of those characters? <laughs> I, had, I had to dig for some of those names. <laughs> which one of those characters was related to Barry Goldwater on Waltz and Ladmo? All right. Question seven. What famous boxer was on Waltz and Ladmo show and appeared more than 20 times starting in the 60s? Was it A, Rocky Marciano? B, Joe Lewis, C, Sonny Liston, or D, Muhammad Ali. So which of those famous boxers was a regular on Walsh and Ladmo? And question eight, what was one of Bill Wallace Thompson's first jobs? Was it A, pool boy, C, a boxer, C, a shoe salesman, or D, valet. So which one of those do you think was one of Bill Wallace Thompson's first jobs? All right, question nine. What musician opened the Coliseum, at, opened at the Coliseum and made an obscene gesture? Was it A, Davy Jones? <coughs> B, Jim Morrison? C, Elvis? Or D, Mini Kiss. So which one of those musicians do you think opened the Coliseum and made an obscene gesture? And closing out our trivia, who epitomized the 60s era of sex, drugs, and rock and roll and was interviewed by Pat McMahon? Was that A, Bob Shane of the Kingston Trio? B, Jimi Hendrix? C, Timothy Leary? Or D, The Beatles? All right. So while you are locking in your final answers, we are going to take a little bit of a music break and talk about Mike Candelo, who was part of the music scene here. Now, he was born in Brooklyn, moved here when he was seven, taught himself to play guitar and started his first band while he was still in high school and then plump, plump, pretty much dropped out and became a professional musician. And that's when kind of the magic started happening. I mean, he, he met folks like Wallace and that led to bigger and better things. He eventually wound up as a member of Hubcap and the Wheels and a variety of other groups before moving to LA and producing 
songs with Jackson Brown, The Tubes, another famous Phoenix band as well. And also was with the Ladmo Trio. All right. So did I leave anything out? I know he produced some uh, an album with an all girl band. Oh, now I now I oh it's blank I'm blanking out. How did <laughs> oh, that the happen? oh the pressure! Oh. <laughs> oh, and it's right on the tip of my tongue too. You know, it'll come to you, I'm sure, as we're going through some other stuff. Now, Mike has also been inducted into the Arizona Music Hall of Fame for all of his contributions. He also wrote a, a screenplay with one of his old bandmates that um, the comic series movies, The Tick, was based on. And I've got a, actually got a copy of the script coming my way from his, uh, his friend um, really soon, hopefully. Wow. Yeah. That's really cool. I hope to get that posted to uh, the Mike Candelo uh, Facebook page as soon as I get it. Very cool. All right. So let's move on to some answers. All right. So back in 1968, what famous presidential candidate visited Christown Mall? And it was B. Robert Kennedy. Wow. Christown would have been quite the mall at that point. Um, yeah. That, it, uh, let me see. That would have been been around for eight years now. And been the hub of so many people going and hanging out at Chris Town. I worked there. I worked two jobs there. One at Farrell's Ice Cream Parlor. And then during the uh, holiday season, right after Thanksgiving, you would see me right on the top of the building holding a uh, walkie-talkie directing traffic. Ah, now, did you ever go to the Janders Closet? Ah, uh, yes. I um, There are pictures, uh, very few of them. Uh, I snuck in there a couple of times, uh, you know, right after I turned 19, which was the alcohol age. And on the Chris Down group on Facebook, you will find uh, a few pictures of the janitor's closet. Nice. I mean, I think that's, I think the one, the one thing I get most asked about if people wonder if it's still there and I'm like, I'm assuming it is and just storage now. Yeah. It's just storage now. And I've tried several times to be able to go down there and look around, but no go. I've tried this. I've tried the same thing and the same thing. It's like, yeah, no. Well, you think with that impressive beard, you know, they would listen to you a little bit more than me. Well, you know, sometimes the beard does do work wonders. I get into places where people normally go, but the Janner's Closet is not one of them, sadly. All right. Question two. <coughs> what music venue was right next to Legend City and once owned by Stevie Nicks' father? C. Compton Terrace. Pretty much my home away from home. So what were some of the acts that you saw there? Uh, you got to put me on the spot here. Um, <laughs> uh, well, Hubcap and the Wheels did play there, and uh, but I didn't see that one. Um, it was a lot, a, a, a lot of local band competitions and just, you know, like music festivals. Uh, uh, because... Okay. Um, you know, money was short for uh, somebody working dishwashing and cooking. So if I could get a cheap music deal, I would go. Nice. Very good. I know from there, then it didn't it move out to Chandler at one point. Uh, for a while. Okay. It's yeah. It, sadly, it's gone. Indeed. People again, you know, it's like, it's like there's so many things that it's like, you know, 
right up like Seneca Pre, Compton Terrace, Legend City. That I mean, it's like you mention these and people just kind of get all misty eyed. I was there opening day for Star Wars at the Cynic Pre. The you know, I was I was just allowed to camp out overnight. I was just talking about um Seneca Pre and how a lot of people said that you, that's where they saw Star Wars was at that great gorgeous. I actually, I actually won all the passes that me and my friends used from Chris Radio. Wow. Yeah, there were there were 10 of us that night. <laughs> and you know, and for folks who wonder what Seneca Pre looked like, if you go to the Arizona Heritage Center, Papago Park, they have a model of Seneca Pre and what it looked like. That was the actual model that was in the Seneca Pre. Oh, I didn't realize that. I thought, oh, cool. It's uh, it spent some brief times at a few historical societies around the valley over the years. Well, I'm glad it found a home there, so people can still see it, and just that kind of that crazy architecture. Oh, it's beautiful. Yeah, indeed. All right, question three. What Miss America used to perform at Legend City? And it's C, Vonda K. Van Dyke. And she's still alive and still doing ventriloquism. Oh, I don't know she was still doing ventriloquism. Because, you know, I ran into her at the Legend City 50th anniversary. Wow. The, why why and, didn't I, 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 I should have met you then. And so, well, you know, that was such a crazy day. Yeah. I mean, everybody was running around. I mean, Vonda K. Van Dyke was there on stage. So I remember some people had, they had brought memorabilia from tickets to costumes. And so I'm much. getting a little washed out there. Sorry, Marshall. <laughs> no, no worries at all. <laughs> so, yeah. So now is that where she honed her skills for uh, Miss America? Oh, yeah. Um, as a matter of fact, um, she used to perform with, um, uh, don't do this to me, Brain, uh, another regular on uh, KPH show and the Wallace and the Ladmo show, Sandy Gibbons. Uh, they used to perform at the saloon at Legend City. Little vaudeville act. Now, somewhere, so I, I have kind of a cache of film, and I think somewhere I have Vonda K. Van Dyke doing her ventriloquism act with a policeman in some school. Uh, I, you know what? I just saw that article when I was doing some research a couple weeks ago. So I, and I, I think, and so I, I, so. Um, there's a guy on Grand Avenue who has a working six because it's six, 16 millimeter film. And so we keep talking about doing a showing. And so because my professor doesn't work and I have no clue why. So, oh, I got to get a copy of that. <laughs> so, yeah, no, as, as soon as it's as soon as I find a working projector, I mean, let's show it. I am like, I want to I don't even know what's there. So oh, it's, gotta be, it's gotta be great. <laughs> well, exactly. And that's my hope. I mean, somebody went through the effort to do this. So I was like, what fun that it, it still exists. And so, all right. And so we talked a little bit about Legend City, but who was the first owner of Legend City? And that would be Lewis Crandall. Um, he passed away a few years ago. Um when he moved to Utah, he was actually in uh, basically your business, but he was running a printing museum. Indeed. Actually, I went to go visit him at the printing museum. He, he, he was a wonderful man. I, I, was, I, I corresponded a lot with him just before he passed away. I'm still talking to his family. Well, and so I actually went up to go visit him in Provo because I had gotten a hold of some film footage that was Legend City. And so I put on DVD and gave it to him. And so he sat there and watched it. 
and you start tearing up because it was like so many members of his family were working there. Oh yeah. I mean, and uh, most of it, I'd say all of his employees thought of him as a father figure and he treated them absolutely well when they were working there. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like a wonderful place. Yeah, it was, it was uh, like all things. Now there's a big SRP building there. <laughs> Indeed. And then they also are left with what some call the curse of legend city. Because now we we still have no major amusement park nearby. No, we, and you can't even count the one at Metro Center as an amusement park. Ah, castles and coasters. Yeah, another high school hangout. Ah, but they have miniature golf. Eh, I like the video games. <laughs> <laughs> Outside is hot. Well, right now it is. Indeed, it's a little too hot for. And this, com and this comes from a guy who works in front of a wood stove all night long. <laughs> it's hot outside. Well, where are you standing? All right. Question five. What famous brothers got their start on the Lou King Ranger show? Mr. Las Vegas and his brother, Jerry and Wayne Newton. So what was the Lou King Ranger show? Um, boy, that thing bounced around from channel to channel. Uh, it was basically a talent show. Highlighting kids. These guys were teenagers when they, they got their break on, on Lou King's show. Ah. It was... It was local, and apparently almost every major city had some sort of version of these talent shows. But, you know, sadly, when the, uh, you know, the mid-60s came and went, so did, uh, so did all these great uh, little local shows for, in favor of the uh, big network shows. Well, right. I mean, like one we didn't talk about was, was it called Teen Beat? Yes, that was uh, one of um, Bill Wallace Thompson's uh, productions. And sadly, that only lasted a year and a half. Um, Whoa, I didn't realize it was so short-lived. Uh, yeah, I think it went from 1961 to 1962. Alice Cooper got his start on that show. Um, um, they, uh, they had a lot of celebrity on uh, on to um, including Liberace, uh, Luke King, the Everly Brothers. Um, I have a 20 or 30 different photos of the performers on Teen Beat, but uh, you know, sadly, it wasn't profitable. Um, okay, all right, question six. What character on Walson and Ladmo was related to Barry Goldwater? Gerald. Yes, in that little film bit, and that little film bit is on YouTube. Um, Gerald refers to him as Uncle Barry. Wow. Yeah, uh, the character of Gerald was always name dropping my uncle owns the station you know uncle barry do you think you could do something about getting me back you know my own show it was all it was all part of the bit it was all fun and games but and this everyone is another famous celebrity that was on the show i do believe this bit was for the 30th anniversary of the show so for folks who don't know, who was Gerald? Oh, Ger uh, he was the villain on the show. They had to have a villain. And to this day, he is still 12 years old. <laughs> he has not aged. He has always been 12 years old. He's always been very rich. His family's always been very rich. He went to a very private exclusive school that only had one 
student and that was him. But that school was uh, modeled after the old boys Judson school in the oh. North Valley. Yes. Very exclusive. He was always getting Ladmo in trouble. He even had monsters. He had uh, the iconic uh, googly-eyed monster um, in the later years, but for one brief period, filmed at Legend City, he had the monster from the Black Lagoon. <laughs> Apparently, that guy was in town. Wallace arranged something and got the guy to get into costume and come out of the lake. It's amazing the pull that uh, Bill Wallace Thompson had with celebrities. So did everybody love Gerald? No, we all hated him. <laughs> we, we all hated him. There was one girl that uh, got a Ladmo bag for kissing him on the cheek. But that's the only girl that ever loved loved him. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed, everyone's spite for Gerald was famous. Yeah, that still scra crawls my skin. <laughs> and I didn't realize he had a last name of Springer. Uh, yeah, it's it, it was used a couple of times. Uh, like um, Aunt Maud has a last name. It's, oh, yeah, uh, Aunt Maud Gantz, G A N T Z, oh. and uh, apparently. She dated Governor Hunt, and since she's still technically alive to this day, we figure her age is about 138. <laughs> but <laughs> when I good. asked her what her age was, she turned on her sprinklers and tried to hit me with her purse. Understandable, because you never ask a lady her age. Exactly. <laughs> Especially when she's hitting hotter than 30. <laughs> oh my. Yeah, Wallace introduced that bit at one point, and I'm thinking to myself, Governor Hunt, oh my God. Even if Aunt Maud was 18 when she started dating him, <laughs> she's in her 130s. She looks pretty good. Pretty spry. Indeed. Oh. All right. So what famous <laughs> boxer was on Walsh and Ladmo and appeared more than 20 times in the 60s? Uh, Muhammad Ali. Yeah, he loved coming on and talking to the kids. Keeping them off drugs, keeping them in school, listening to their parents. Unfortunately, it's this picture and one short piece of videotape is all that we have of all those times he was on the show. Wow. And I do believe that uh, Wallace's boxing career uh, probably had something to do with their friendship. Ah, uh, okay. Oh, did I spoil a question answer? That's okay. No yeah, worries. Okay. Uh, you know, <laughs> it's all good. And so, Wow. And, you know, I think also at the time period, that would have been kind of cutting edge for a children's show to have somebody who was Afro-American on. Uh, yeah, exa exactly. Uh, I think I at one point uh, I sent you a photo of the first black chef on a cooking show. And that was also on KPHO. I cannot remember his name. I don't remember his name either, but I remember when you sent that to me and I was like, wow, who knew we were so cutting edge? KPHO, you know, started as a radio station back in the 40s and they've been, they've been basically going strong. It's just amazing how long that they have been in operation. So when you talk about radio, you had mentioned Chris. So what was Chris and what was its competitor? Oh, it, uh, well, its competitor was Crux. <laughs> Chris Radio was the top 40 of the day. Um, the screaming, hysterical girl music, you know, uh, the Beatles, you know, uh, the Beach Boys, 
you name it, they were on it. Uh, even the monkeys, the monkeys. Um, ah. And uh, Pat McMahon was the program director for over a decade at uh, the at the height of uh, Chris's. Um, <laughs> oh, I didn't, uh, oh, I didn't realize he actually worked with the radio station. Yeah. I didn't realize he'd worked with the radio station. Uh, he, man, uh, he would do uh, the news and weather and sports on KBHO uh, after doing Wallace and Ladmo bits and then run back to the uh, Chris radio to do his to do his programming job. And then it, it's all the appearances that these guys did were all over the valley on Saturdays and Sundays and holidays. These guys did not stop. Wallace never took a vacation in all this time. Wow. And if Ladmo or Pat wanted a vacation, they filmed everything ahead of time. So Wallace could just replay it on off of video. Ah, okay. But he was there every day. Wow. And he got fat. And, you know, and I mean, also, and you, admit, you had mentioned Hubcap had the wheels. I mean, besides, do, I didn't realize besides music programming, being on Wilson Ladmo. Oh, oh. There was also that whole thing with Hubcap and the wheels. Hubcap and the wheels actually beat out the Beatles in the, uh, Phoenix market for weeks and Wallace and a lot of people don't know this Wallace was a huge practical joker along with Ladmo they had one point convinced Pat McMahon through a fake letter that the Beatles wanted Hubcap and the wheels to open for them when they came to Phoenix yeah <laughs> oh my and they played so many jokes on poor Pat that when Orson Welles' office actually called him to work on an Orson Welles film, Pat did not believe it. And Wallace and Ladmo were just, no, we really had nothing to do with this guy, <laughs> Pat. But... Uh, the other side of the wind was the last uh, movie that uh, Orson Welles was working on, and it never got finished, but Pat was in the opening sequence. And uh, that footage is on the fan site and YouTube. Uh, it's called The Other Side of the Wind. And Orson Welles, one of the guy who played Captain Super, to be on the on in his movie, and that was another one of Pat's kind of characters. Uh, oh God, uh, Captain Super, Aunt Maud, Bobby Joe Trouble, uh, the Wizard, the Magician, Marshall Good. Uh, a little known early character was Captain Zumar, who was a vegetable alien. Um, Guy <laughs> Good. Um, he oh, and he played one of my favorites that was on during the seventies. Nuru the Guru, and his driver Vinny. It's always his driver Vinny. Sounded like a mob mob guru to me. <laughs> Indeed, but that's a whole other topic. Yeah. <laughs> All right. And so what was one of Bill Wallace's first jobs? Uh, if you're wondering Oscar. what happened to Wallace, it was the moon pies. <laughs> wow. I know. Yeah. That's. I had no idea when I first saw this picture, I go, yeah, that's Wallace who photoshopped his head onto that body. Oh, wait, they didn't have Photoshop back then. <laughs> right. Man, and he, he was, was able he to see the chest ripped. Yeah. He was big into physical exercise back then. And uh, we have a few more boxing photos of him actually boxing. Uh, but 
yeah, that there we go. The, his his actual first job. This was like his second job. He worked a fruit stand. Um, One of those roadside fruit stands in Arizona. Which there's still there's still a couple. Somebody was just talking about one down, I think, on I want to say like baseline and 16th Street. There's still one of the kind of the old school fruit stands still there. Oh yeah. And so oh, yeah. Uh, I think I saw it a couple days ago when I was down that way. So yeah, so I, I need to get back. I need to go down there and buy some local produce and fresh off. Uh, the I'll just go to fries. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm always up for an adventure and, you know, and I'm sure they've yeah. got some great stories. And so, all right. So question nine, what musician opened at the Coliseum? Oh, I didn't put the photo in here. I forgot. Oh, that, to uh, opened the Coliseum and made an obscene gesture. It was Jim Morrison. Yep. And uh, we we did have a picture of uh, Pat McMahon interviewing Jim Morrison, which that must have been quite a trip. Uh, well, it you know the perks of uh, being the program director for Chris Radio certainly you know you get to, he got to meet all the famous musicians of the day, and. God love him. I would have loved to have met Jim Morrison too. But Pat also met Davy Jones. Oh. And I I'm assuming if Elvis came to Phoenix during the Chris era, Pat probably met him too. Oh, so they probably did. I have no idea who Mini Kiss is. <laughs> so it is a group of sh people of short stature that perform. Oh. <laughs> okay now i'm gonna have to google that later they, they i've got to see that they've actually been at the state fair a couple times oh my god that's got to be so funny and so it, it's hilarious one of the first concerts i actually did see was kiss and now you can see them but just shorter uh is it the same is it the same length of uh program you know or is it a little mini concert um, I'm yeah, just because yeah. you know, you guys know where I got my sense of humor. Uh, you're a little short. I also hear they have no. short tempers, you know, short, set, short tempers. Okay, <laughs> we could go on and on. <laughs> no offense to any short people out there, but the Coliseum was quite the place. I mean, so many musicians. Oh, yeah. Um, and uh, there used to be bigger names at the Coliseum during the fair days. When admission to the fair, oh. you could uh, really see a lot of great concerts in that short two, three-week period um, of the fair. And uh, Wallace and Ladmo always played. And he, I, Wallace must have been hanging about stage doors because the friendships he made with all these country stars and musicians would come back later. Amanda, uh, Amanda Blake played at the fair one year. And when she moved to Phoenix, she was already friends with Wallace. I swear that man tied the Valley music scene, TV and radio all together in one little nexus wow he would he would and um i uh i have a, a newspaper article where dolan ellis met wallace and ladmo at legend city and he became longtime friends with dolan ellis and subsequently marshall trimble i believe you've had both of them on your show before indeed yes I, I love those guys a lot. I uh, just finished all my research on Dolan Ellis, and I'm going to be sending off all his newspaper articles uh, over to uh, to uh, his home. And then uh, I'm scheduled a couple weeks from now to start uh, getting all of Marshall Trimble's articles. Oh, wow. That's going to be a lot. Uh, well, <laughs> 
not as much as Wallace and the Ladmo. I down oh, I that, that have is true. That's downloaded true. about ten thousand articles. Wow. And ads, yeah. They were in the paper every day. Every day. Well, because you were saying they had so many the, there was the show, there was personal appearances, and the fact uh, that it ran for so long. And the thing about that, the newspaper site with all of these little ads and notices of appearance, I have I can now make a very detailed timeline of where these guys were almost every day of the week. I did not know I wanted that level of uh, intimacy with their comings and goings, even though I love the men dearly. So one thing that you've also mentioned has been a Ladmo bag. Um, what would you like to know about? So what what was it? I mean, because not, not everybody grew up here and oh. is still bemoaning the fact that they didn't get one. Well, a Ladmo bag... Uh, originated uh, back in the late 60s uh, when when you were on the show you could pick from a, a wall of toys from the toy cottage uh, but the kids would take so damn long to get it so um, Pat McMahon said why don't you just stuff it in a bag throw Ladmo's name on it and just give it to him you know don't don't let them choose. Just give them a boy or girl. But the Ladmo bag evolved to having treats and coupons and pizza and stuff and ice cream coupons, soda, potato chips, all from sponsors who would sponsor the show. Uh, and they used to be huge affairs, big grocery store bags. But the problem is... In the late 70s, the FTC stepped in and said, you can't keep mentoring uh, these full-blown commercials on your kids' shows. So you could only mention the name of the thing as you were stuffing it in this Ladmo bag. <coughs> so the show had a lot of sponsors, and that's where they got all their stuff for the Ladmo bags. The rule for the Ladmo bags is it had to have an autograph photo in it and at least 10 good items like a can of soda, Twinkies, chips, pizza coupons, ice cream coupons, candy. Problem is Wallace used to anger the sponsors all the time by kicking their products all over the set or making fun of them. Uh, one famous uh, clip that's out there is Wallace actually a accidentally dropped a, a bottle of Bactine. It hit the floor and he goes, listen, you can hear the germs screaming. That was Wallace. He was, as Steven Spielberg put it, he was Saturday Night Live before there was Saturday Night Live. <laughs> <laughs> he actually kicked a moon pie on set and that was the last time moon pies ever sponsored Ladmo bags wow and when we used to have uh, little Wallace and Ladmo conventions before he passed away we would always start the convention off with him kicking a moon pie of course all right, there we go. Yep. All right, question 10. Oh, and I was bad about this one as well. I didn't do it so. Okay, so who epitomized the 60s era of sex, drugs, and rock and roll and was interviewed by Pat? Jimi Hendrix. Indeed. God, I would have... Wouldn't you just want to be the program director for Chris? Indeed. I'm sure they shared lots of stories and other things as well. That was some good music. Uh, yes. I didn't even, I knew the Kingston trio, but I don't know who Bob Shane is. So he was, so he actually was the last original member and he lived down in Chandler for quite a while. Oh, actually, wow. I, I, he was down in Awatuki for a while. Um, I'm, I'm assuming he's not with us anymore. He is not. 
Oh, um, and they, they did a pilot for a show here called Three Young Men in a Hurry. Oh, I remember that. So, yes. Yeah, so, actually, I did an event where we showed that and then had Bob come and talk about why they didn't want, why it didn't go anywhere. And it was because all three of them were living in Hawaii and they didn't want to have to come to Phoenix to film more episodes. So they stopped. Oh, that's a shame. And, um, and he wound up moving here. I know that Pat was on the Dick Van Dyke show a couple of times as some weird character. Some oh, weird character. Now, is that when Dick Van Dyke had a studio up in Cave Creek? Yes. Ah, I, okay. you know what? I'll uh, I'll I'll send you the link to the videos in the fan club archives. Okay, yeah, no, so that you watch them. Yeah, yeah, no, that would be great because I'm assuming that was diagnosis murder or no, it was the actual Dick Van Dyke show. Oh wow! No, he very, comedy all the way. Very cool. All right. Well, I always like to ask people how they did because, you know, it is a quiz, so it doesn't really matter how many you got right or wrong, but look at the stories and, you know, we may need to do a part two because we didn't touch on Aquanetta. I mean, there's so many amazing Aquanetta stories. And of course, Don Bowles. Don Bowles is another topic. Mike Candelo. Yeah. So we may, we may have to do a part two at some point. I'll be happy to come back. All and right. um, next time I'll give away a Ladmo pack. Oh, fun. Wow. Whoever gets the most right answers will keep track in the chat. Now, is, it, is, it, is it original can of soda that's in there? No, or no, 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 no. Okay. Um, I okay. actually have, uh, I have a lot of blank bags here uh, that I use for the fan club when we do do promotions. Uh, Ladmo bags have to be won or given away. Um, I have stencils um, to make it look like an original Ladmo bag because I don't have the actual over stamps. But I am allowed, I was authorized by Wallace uh, over 23 years ago to give out official Ladmo bags as part of the fan club. And um, I tell you, that was the first time I had ever been over to uh, Wallace's condo and i was just dumbfounded um that i was sitting there with my childhood hero who would later become one of my best friends as an adult it was just wow it, it, it was a wonderful ride and it was one of it, it was one of the three saddest days in my life the day that ladmo passed away i cried for for days the day my father passed away, I cried for days. And the day Wallace passed away, I was I was I was just heartbroken. I was just heartbroken because this man taught me uh, so much over the course of 61 years um, that I, I, I he was with us every day. It didn't matter to him. Monday through Friday on KPHO, sometimes on the weekends, and all those grand personal appearances where he didn't talk down to us. He treated us like his kids and like adults. And that's what made all three of these men very special to, to me and to the 40,000 members of the fan club. As a matter of fact, one of my... Um, one of my uh, fellow uh, moderators is in your in your chat right now. That's Brian Clowmaster. I don't know what that means, but um, we uh, the whole purpose is of history. I believe is not to forget. Um, I've I've said this for a long time. You got to be passionate about history. It doesn't matter if you're passionate about the whole expanse or just your little favorite topic in your life that you loved. Um, I happen to love a little bit more topics than most people because uh, you can tell by a lot of my postings on uh, the Valley history sites that I, 
I really want people to remember. I want people to come together and remember and share. And that's why we get more videotapes from Wallace and Ladma. We get more photos. We get all those wonderful memories that need to be documented and saved. And that's, that's what we're doing. And that's really what I'm passionate about. And uh, I encourage everybody who's not in the fan club to come join us. Even if you're just a short time Phoenix native, come and join us. This is your history. This is where you're from now. And you got to remember and it's just part of that collective kind of consciousness of knowing, I mean, and that's the thing. It's part of that fabric that's ingrained in everything. Yeah. I mean, the fact that Pat is still around doing stuff. Oh, yeah. And um, when I decide to retire from the fan club, uh, my successor has been named. And it's it, he's very appropriate. He's also a friend of yours. Marshall, Billy Lowry, Wallace's grandson. Oh, oh nice. Will um, get uh, this huge five terabyte hard drive full of everything. Wow. I, I, it, I, I could not believe it filled it up that fast. I'm going to need to get another one. But we're also in the Library of Congress. I send everything regularly to the Library of Congress. Oh, nice. Okay. On thousand year rated CDs. They will last a thousand years in the Library of Congress. Wow. This is what we do. And the reason why I do this is very personal reason. I was not very popular in high school or grade school. And um, I was often picked on and bullied. Um, but these three men saved my life because I could come home and I had friends. They, did, they weren't talking to anybody else but me, but I found out from a lot of people, these men saved a lot of lives. Wow. Um, I have a good friend named Reed. Wallace personally saved his life one day invited him to come to the movies with him when he met him at uh, a theater and Reed was um, just about ready to end it all. And that day as an adult, Wallace turned it around and Reed's doing fine. That's great. It's all because of these men that they just spanned generation after generation after generation of goodness, fun, and entertainment. Indeed. And and helped create the valley that we all know and love. Of course. And so, so Chris, thank you so much for coming on and sharing. Um, I definitely look forward to having you back. We can talk about some of your other passions as well. Oh, all right. Yeah. And um, I um, come join us at the Walson and Ladmo fan club on Facebook. Um, I'm also known as the friendly neighborhood historian now. Uh, that's one of my taglines. I'm also known on TikTok as the delusional fry cook. And that's where you can see a lot of Wallace and Ladmo clips oh, that I post okay. every day. Uh, they're also totally on the fan club for free, just the way Wallace wanted them. But you guys, come have a laugh. Come have the laugh at the end of the day and remember. Indeed. That's all I got, Marshall. I, I, I'm right. jacked out. <laughs> Chris, thank you so much. Have a great rest of your night. You're welcome. And thank you, Marshall. Thank you. Night, Bye. everyone. Oh, that was so wonderful. Oh, Chris, thank you so much for sharing that important part of our history. And so now we're going to talk a little bit about Casa Grande or the Big Mud House, which is actually in Coolidge, not in Casa Grande. So there should be a song, something about like Istanbul, but not Constantinople. Um, so basically, you know, the Hukum were, they were expert farmers. 
they develop thousands of miles of canals to help get water around and to basically make things grow and survive here. As well as out of Caliche, they were able to build, this is said to it took about, I think like 3000 tons of Caliche to build this four story structure that people now believe was for observing kind of the cosmos, what was going on. Now, when the first Europeans got here, this was existing, but the Hokum were nowhere to be found. So this was really one of the earliest sites preserved. Um, then, because it is a mud house, there have been a variety of attempts to basically shield it. And then in the 30s, Frederick Law Olmsted Jr., designed this structure, which is beautiful in its own right as well, to protect that big mud house. So it's a great national monument. You can go visit and learn all about the ball games that they would play, different ceremonies they would do, and just kind of see what a village would have looked like um, back in the, that day, thousands of years ago. So if you have not been, I think it's one of those must-do things. So now you'll see why I always say, you know, if you're watching on Facebook, please click that share button because, you know, we get to have a lot of fun with Arizona history. Coming up next week, we have the Greater Phoenix Equality Chamber of Commerce. It is my friend Michael and Greg coming on talking about the history of that as we get to end Pride Month. So look forward to seeing you all the end of next month or next week, next Thursday. Thank you so much and have a great rest of your night. And as we say good night, please, if you feel like it or if you have any ideas for shows, please reach out because I love to hear from you. I always love to give a, a shout out to Chris and Cole who did that great kind of intro video as well as PJ, my advisor. And so as we say good night, I, since, you know, we talked about a variety of things. Let's see. We are going to hear a little bit from Vonda K. Van Dyke as she is performing her talent for Miss America. I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll let Chad, we'll compromise. What do you mean? Well, um, we'll sing a duet. 